Facebook Live. Good to see you coming to you from Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. We brought Hope down here uh, Tuesday. She's been serving with uh, Impact Ministries now for the last two days. Haven't really heard from her or seen her. I haven't. Uh, Heather, I think, has heard from her through a few text messages and everything. But uh, I know they had an international cafe last night where they meet with uh, internationals who are down here in foreign exchange and uh, share Christ with them. And, Hope is they come to know Jesus and take Jesus back home. So good to see each and every one of you. I hope everyone's doing well on this uh, midweek, Wednesday night. Getting a little rain down here. I don't know what's going on back where you are. But uh, if you have your Bibles tonight, turn with me to Luke chapter 17. One of my favorite passages of Scripture uh, in Luke 17, verses 11 through 19. It's a, it's a story that's going to be very familiar to you. And uh, I want to share uh, just three points tonight, just three brief points about uh, maybe our reaction to when we're healed by Jesus. You see, as a believer in Jesus Christ, we have been healed. We have been healed from sin. We've been healed from our past. We've been healed from the penalty uh, of death. We've been healed from uh, anything that could go wrong, guilt, shame. All that has been eradicated and taken care of. And now we have heaven as our home. We have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And all those things are just amazing healing processes that take place and, and, and cleansing that takes place. It's not anything that we can do. Uh, we're not righteous in any way, shape, or form. And uh, so when we're healed, how do we react? And so here we are in uh, Luke chapter 17, <clears throat> starting in verse number 11 and going through verse number 19. It says, Now it happened as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And he entered a certain village there and met ten men who were lepers who stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So when he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priest. And so it was that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice glorified God. And he fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. So Jesus answered and said, were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Arise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love and your mercy and your grace. And God, we come to you tonight, Lord. We just heard from our governor uh, staying in uh, phase two for three more weeks requiring face masks to be worn. Uh, seems like we're just held captive by so many things with this coronavirus and so many things that are going on. And Father, we know that you're in control of all things, God, that nothing happens outside of your permissive will. And so, Lord, we don't understand what's going on often. And sometimes we get angry, at least I do. And Father, uh, we don't have all the answers, but we know that you do. And so, Lord, we come to you tonight just asking, Lord, for you to give us wisdom, to give us understanding, to help us to seek after you, to be an example to those around us who are uh, from a lost and dying world, those who don't know Jesus, don't know you. Father, help us to live in a way that they can see our faithfulness to you and bring glory and honor to you. Lord, I want to lift up to you those who are sick and those who are hurting, those who are struggling, Lord, those who've gone through uh, so many stages of, of sickness, Lord, through this coronavirus, Lord, those who uh, have cancer, those who have heart disease, Lord, those who are struggling with so many things that are going on right now in their bodies, Lord, uh, we know that you are the great physician, and we know that you can speak healing at any given time, Lord, and when you speak healing, it's done, it's done, it's a matter of fact thing, just like with these lepers, you told them to go do something as they were doing and, and acting the obedient, they found out they were healed, Lord, and that healing was, was a lifetime healing. And so, Father, I pray for your healing hand upon so many who are hurting and so many who are sick. Lord, I pray that you be with those who may be going through a difficult time financially right now. Maybe their jobs haven't started back up, and maybe they're trying to, to figure out how they're going to make ends meet. God, we just pray that you will be the God who provides, or Jehovah Jireh, Lord, that you'll provide our need, whatever it may be. God, help us to be wise in that, that maybe we have to put some of our wants aside to, to be able to take care of our needs, Lord, but help us to be mindful that, that you will provide. You'll provide that which we need, Lord, the clothes on our back, the roof over our head, and Lord, and the food that we eat, you provide that. You promise us that, Lord, so help us to be mindful of that. 
Father, for those who may be struggling with uh, just difficult situations, uh, maybe emotional situations, maybe relational situations, God, we just pray that you give wisdom and strength and comfort as only you can. For those who've stepped out in new areas of life and ministry, God, we pray that you'd be with them, lead, guide, and direct them. For those who are traveling on vacation, God, we ask for your travel mercies upon them. Allow them to enjoy your creation and time together with family, Lord, but pray, God, that you'll keep them safe and protected. And Father, for, for the things that we have going on, Lord, on July the 4th, our 4th of July outreach and celebration, God, we pray that many, many people will come to that. And we pray that many, many people will come to know Jesus through that. Pray that our church would be a, a, an outreach opportunity, Lord, to, to reach out to our community, to show them love, to show them that, that you can worship Jesus and still have a good time. Father, we just pray for every aspect of that that night, Lord, praying that you'll bring the right people there who need to, to hear from you. Father, we thank you for loving us and caring for us. And ask now, God, that you speak through your word as only you can. And Lord, just give us ears to hear. And I pray, Lord, now for the words of my mouth and meditations of my heart to be acceptable to you, O oh God. For it's in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. Okay, just a few things right here. These lepers were 100% obedient to what Jesus told them to do. He was, they were 100% obedient. They lived out what Jesus told them to do. He told them to go and show yourselves to the priest. And as they were going, the Bible says that they were healed. They looked down, they saw their healing. One, when he saw he was healed, he turned around and he came back and he gave God glory. He fell at Jesus' feet and he lifted up his voice, uh, giving him glory uh, for what he had done, for what had taken place. And so as we think about obedience, obedience is a, is a key in anything that we do in our life. And so we should allow our faith to show that obedience, I think, in three different ways. And, and there's three ways that I want to share with you tonight. The first way is that the faith in Jesus should be lived out in obedience uh, in the way that we make our request and, the, and to whom we make our request. Here we see these lepers. It says, now it happened that as Jesus was going to Jerusalem. you got to realize he was going back to Jerusalem for the Passover. This is the last week of his life, and he goes, deliberately goes through, the Bible says, that he passed through the midst, right through the middle of Samaria and Galilee. Now, this is unheard of for a Jew, especially a rabbi, to go through this forbidden area. Samaria was a place where half-breed Samaritans lived. It was a place that, that, that Jews were hated, and Samaritans were hated by Jews. It just didn't make sense for Jesus to go there, but he deliberately went through this city, because he knew that there was people there who needed healing. And as he was going there, the Bible says uh, that as he entered the, the village, that he met ten lepers uh, who stood afar off, man, social distance. And right there it is in the Bible. Y'all didn't think it was exact. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding, guys. Don't, don't take me serious on that. I'm, I'm not a, a fan of social distance in any way. But it was a real deal. It was a real deal. If you were a leper, you had to stay off. You had to live in your own colony. You had to cry out, unclean, unclean, unclean. You had to do all these things. And these lepers didn't do what they were supposed to do. They, they looked at Jesus and they saw something different. They saw someone different. And, and instead of crying out, unclean, unclean, stay away, stay away, stay away. We got the dreaded disease. We got this thing, you know, you got a social distance, six feet, 25 feet, more like 100 feet for them. You know, they could, they'd have to yell and scream to get your attention. And if they didn't do this, they could be killed for it. And so they cried out. The Bible says they cried out. So they cried out. They lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Man, what, what, a, what a statement. They looked and, and they knew Jesus. How did they know him? I don't know. Maybe word had got out. Maybe the crowd that was preceding Jesus as he, he was going to Jerusalem, uh, they were asking, hey man, who's with you? Who's, who's got the big mob over there? Hey, it's Jesus. Jesus. Wow, I've heard about Jesus. I've heard about the miracles. I've heard about him feeding the 5,000. I've heard about him raising Jairus' daughter from, from the dead. I've heard about how he, he healed the man who was lowered down uh, from the roof. I heard how he turned the water into wine. I heard how he fed the 5,000, how he calmed the storm. I heard all these things. So let's cry out to Jesus. And here's what they did. They cried out to Jesus. They recognized and realized that he was something different. And they just didn't say, hey, Jesus, Rabbi, come here. No, Jesus, Master, Jesus, Lord, Jesus, owner, ruler, whatever it is that, that we want to call, but Jesus here was Lord to them. He was the master of their life. He, they cried out, Jesus, master. They recognized his position of authority. They recognized their position of weakness, and they cried out to him, and they asked just to say, well, have mercy on us. What an amazing thought. Man, I so many times we want we we cry out to God and we want healing. We cry out to God and we want money. We cry out to God and we want you know great relationships. We cry out to God. We want jobs. We want all these benefits of this life. 
But, but when's the last time that we cried out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on me. Wow, mercy, not getting what I deserve. These lepers deserve to be in this colony. These lepers, based on their skin condition, where their digits would fall off, where it was a highly contagious disease, they, they couldn't be around people. And they were isolated from society, and they were made fun of, and they couldn't go to their families. I mean, it's a lot like what we're going through today. If you stop and think about coronavirus, you get it, you got to quarantine for 14 days. you you got to let people know that you've got it. They've got these contract tracers out there who are marking people, letting you know, hey, you were in the presence of this person. They got corona. You might have it. You need to quarantine yourself for 14 days. Crazy, crazy stuff that, that was going on over 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago, these lepers were going through something similar to us. So it's not something new. And, and you know what? What caused it to happen? What, what made them have all these rules and regulations? God wrote it down in the law. And the law was upheld by the Pharisees. This was the law. And a lot of people are complaining about the law today, that we shouldn't do this and we shouldn't do, you know, we need to go again. And I'm going to be honest with you. There's lots of times I'd like to buck up and go against the law. But I feel like as a Christian, we need to set the example for the world to see that, you know what, we can abide by the rules and the regulations that are out there because the law has yet to say that, you know what, you can't worship God. I just said you can't worship the way you like to. And so we found ways around to be able to worship. And so here, these these lepers are far off and they're crying out, man, Jesus, have there's a couple things here. They made an amazing request. Their request was to Jesus. They probably cried out to priests. They probably cried out to, to uh all kinds of people who come through, faith healers, maybe religious zealots. <clears throat> they could have cried out to a lot of different people along the way, trying to get healing and couldn't get healing. But here they cry out to Jesus and they call him by position of authority, Lord. Lord, because the word master right there is not the word for Elohim or Jehovah, but it, it, it is the, the, the same term as being a Lord or owner, master, ruler, somebody who's over us. And so that, that term... They're recognizing him as being a person in authority and in power. Have mercy on us. And we see these lepers, they were, they were crying out to Jesus. They could have cried out to anybody, but they cried out to Jesus, recognizing and realizing that something could happen. You know, I should be crying out, Lord, have mercy on me. Uh, if you remember the prayer that was going on in the temple when Jesus brought his disciples in, there was a publican and there was a basically a Pharisee. And the Pharisee was in there, Lord, thank you that I'm not like this publican over here. Thank you that I give my tithes. Thank you that I'm so amazing. Man, Lord, look at, look at that. God, did, I'm just a specimen. I mean, I'm just a religious specimen. The Pharisee was crying out, Lord, you ought to be grateful that I'm in here worshiping you. That was the arrogance that he had. And the publican over there wouldn't even lift his eyes up to heaven. He was beating his chest and saying, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And it's the exact same thing that these, these lepers cried out, Lord, have mercy. Have mercy on me, a sinner. And what did Jesus choose to do? He chose to heal them. He, he chose to do something that was amazing. You know, many times we fail to live out our faith in Jesus. Why? Because we're disobedient. We're disobedient. We don't ask exactly what needs to happen. We ask a lot of different things. Uh, there's, there's so many times in Scripture that, that Jesus would confront somebody and he would ask him, what is it you want me to do? Blind Barnabas, what do you want me to do? Well, I'd like to have my sight back. Okay, he gave him his sight. If Blind Barnabas would have asked for a pillow, Jesus probably would have given him a pillow. If he'd asked to been able to walk, great, he'd have probably done that. But no, he asked for his vision because he was blind. And when we get specific and we ask and here, these lepers realize that Jesus, if you'll be merciful on me and not give me what I deserve, which is to be isolated because the law says so, uh, to have this disease in which digits are going to fall off, I may lose arms, fingers, toes, all these things. I'm never going to be with my family again. I'm an outcast in society. Jesus, if you'll just have mercy on me and not give me this, why? Why do I, I deserve it? Because of sin. I, I don't know how leprosy came about. I don't know how common it was. I don't know how easy it was to, to, to get rid of. I don't think you could get rid of it unless somebody like God healed you. And so they cried out, Lord, have mercy on us. And Jesus was merciful. Uh, you know, imagine these men, if they had called um, to Buddha. Imagine if they had called to Muhammad. Imagine if they had called to, you know, some other religious zealot out there. What's going to happen? They're still going to be sick. They're still going to be needing mercy. They're still going to need to be healing. They cry out in a lot of different ways. But when they cried out to Jesus, they cried out to the one who could take care of their needs. And so if we want to show ultimate faith, 
and ultimate obedience in our faith. It needs to be in our request to God. We need to be real with God. We need to be honest with God. We need to let him know, you know what, I'm not perfect. I've got needs. Lord, I'm asking you to meet these needs right now. And he is faithful uh, to, to do those things in which fits into his will. And we all, we've all we always got to realize and we've always got to pray and always request your will be done. Remember the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Lord, how, how amazing, how awesome you are. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What an amazing thing for his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to be obedient in our quest. The second thing is this. The second way that our faith in Jesus should be lived out in obedience is in our response. Look at what happened right here. If you don't mind, look at verse number 14. It says, so when he saw them, he said to them, this is Jesus. He looked at them. He heard them. He saw them. He just kind of caught them and said, look, guys, here's what I want you to do. Go show yourselves to the priest. Go show yourselves to the priest. And the Bible says that they, they waited a couple hours. They wanted to make sure they were looking good. You know, this request, this re request from Jesus, this, this response from Jesus, hey, go show yourself, didn't make any sense because they could not rightfully go show themselves to the priest if they still were leprous. Because he's going to say, no, you still have leprosy. You're still an unclean human being. You've still got this outcast mentality that's going to stay with you. But Jesus said, go show yourselves to the priest. And immediately as they were going, the Bible says, and so it was that as they went, they were cleansed. As soon as they responded to Jesus in faith, he said, go show ourselves to the priest. Well, let's go to the temple. And that's where they went. They went to the temple to go show themselves as a priest. It wouldn't have made sense for them to stick around. Nobody could, could pronounce them clean. Jesus could heal them right there, but Jesus couldn't pronounce them clean. The priest had to. Jesus was following the law. Jesus was following the law. Therefore, the church should follow the law. Uh, and I, I've gotten some backlash. And, and the reason I say this is because I've gotten some backlash on Facebook. I just posted uh, on our website. I had Jonathan Greer post on our website that we will not be moving inside on July the 5th because of the governor's orders. Uh, we're still under the 25 uh, social gathering thing on the inside, and we can't, you know, our church holds more than that, and we have more people who come to worship, so we're going to do outside worship, and we're going to be there at 9.30 this coming Sunday and maybe keep it like that until we are able to go inside. But we have to follow the law. We need to set the example. There's a lot of churches who are going in a different direction. It's perfectly okay. They have to answer for God for that. I don't care what they do. I'm going to do what God's telling me to do. And I've caught some backlash. And I hope and pray that you'll continue to pray for me, that God will give me wisdom and our deacons as we choose to follow obediently the Lord to do what we're supposed to. But here Jesus was following the law. Go show yourselves a priest. I can heal you guys, but he's the one who has to tell you that you're clean. I can't. Jesus was following the law. He didn't go running up to him. To him, look at it, verse number 14. And so when he saw them, he heard them, and then he saw them, and then he said to them, go show yourselves as a priest. It doesn't say that Jesus went over there and touched them or anything like that. No, he was following the law. He wasn't going over there to touch them. He could have because he's Jesus, because he's God in every way, shape, or form. He would have been perfectly okay to touch those lepers and never would have got leprosy. But he, he followed the law. And so he did the right thing, and so did they. they. They all of a sudden took off. They listened obediently, and as they went, it made no sense for them to go. Man, I, I don't know how many times I can emphasize that. It made no sense for those lepers to go to the priest. Why? Because as they looked down, they still had leprosy. They still had the sores on their body and everything. But they went in obedience to God. It didn't make sense for Noah to build an ark out in the middle of the desert and spend 100 years, 120 years doing it. Didn't make any sense. Why? Because it never rained before. No, why are you building them? It's going to rain. What's rain? I don't know. Water going to come down from the sky. Wow. Really? We've never seen that before. Yep, it's going to rain. People laughed. People made fun. People everything. But then whenever it started raining, guess what? People were knocking on the door trying to get in. It didn't make sense for Joshua and the children of Israel to march around Jericho seven times and start screaming and shouting. It didn't make sense for that to happen. But that was the command that God gave to Joshua, and Joshua followed out. And the Bible says that on that seventh day, when they marched around seven times, and they screamed and shouted, and they blowed the trumpets, guess what? The walls came tumbling down. It didn't make sense for Gideon to go from 30,000 men down to 300 men to fight 100,000 men. It didn't make sense. 
But God wanted to show Gideon that he was going to fight the battle. But these 300 weren't going to fight the battle. They were going to be obedient. But God was going to use them. And as he used them, God was going to take care of the battle. To show Gideon that God said, I'm in control. I'm going to take care of you, Gideon. You just got to trust me. It didn't make sense for that to happen. It didn't make sense for Jesus' disciples to follow him whenever he said, hey, guys, come and follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. What? You're going to make it? Man, we're good fishermen, but you're going to make us fishers of men. I don't know what you're talking about. Okay, we're going to drop our nets. We're going to leave our boat, and we're going to come follow you for three and a half years. didn't make sense for that to happen. It didn't make sense for you and for I and for others to say, you know, when the Lord was convicting us that we had sin in our life and that we needed a Savior to cry out to the Lord Jesus to come in our heart to save us, and it changes, and for us to repent. That didn't make sense. But it makes all the sense in the world whenever our name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life and we know that heaven's our home. And so our response, in our response, we can show ultimate obedience in our faith in the way that we live out our faith. The leper's response here as a whole, as ten guys, was to go, and as they went, they were cleansed. But there was also one leper who had an even greater response that when he saw that he was healed, the Bible says this in verse number 15, and one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face, uh, at his feet, giving thanks, and he was a Samaritan. You see, one man came back and gave all the glory to God because he realized, you know what, I didn't deserve it. He had mercy on me. I'm going to go and I'm going to praise him. I'm going to go and I'm going to worship him. I'm going to go, and I'm going to do everything that I can to say thank you to the man who just healed me. He realized where it came from. When's the last time you or I, in our response to God's healing, fell down on our face, grabbed hold of his ankles and said, Lord, thank you, thank you, and gave him the glory for it. Lots of times we go to the doctor. The doctors tell us we're doing just fine. We're taking a lot of medicine. We said, man, that's a good doctor. He gave us medicine. We don't realize that God used the medicine. God used the doctor to diagnose, and God did the healing. We want to give all the glory and all the credit to other people. Don't get me wrong. In their obedience, God used them. But who does the healing? God. God's the one who does the healing. Until he speaks healing to the body, there ain't nothing going to happen. God brings people into our lives. God mends relationships. God brings about forgiveness. God brings about strength. God brings about understanding. God takes away fear and anxiety. God is in control. And when we respond to him as this one leper, thank you, Lord. Man, how amazing it is. How amazing it is. So, so the first thing is, the first way that our faith in Jesus should be lived out in obedience is in our request. The second is in our response. And finally, the third way that our faith in Jesus should be lived out in obedience is in our reward. <clears throat> Here comes this hated foreigner. Here comes this, this Samaritan. This one, I don't know what the other nine were, but this one comes back. He was the one who was least likely to come back because this Jew over here and his Samaritan hated one another. There was enmity, man. They called them dogs. Uh, they were the lowest of low people. And the Samaritan came back and he saw Jesus and he fell down on his feet, face at his feet and he grabbed hold of him and he worshiped him. And Jesus looked at him and said this, this is your reward. So Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed, but where are the nine? Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Arise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. Jesus brought about salvation in the life of this Samaritan right there because of his faith to trust Jesus, to come back and worship God, to fall on his feet, and to, to give him all the glory. Now Jesus gave him everlasting life. What an amazing thing. Jesus called him a foreigner. Listen to you and I and anybody who does not know God, anybody who's lost and comes to faith in Jesus Christ. We were foreigners. We were foreigners. And now we're brought in the family through adoption. We're no longer foreigners. Now we're family. What an amazing thing. And Jesus looks and he says, look, this foreigner came back. Why did he come back? It made absolutely no sense. If anybody should have come back, it shouldn't have been him. But he came back and he worshiped. And Jesus just asked him, where's everybody else? What's going on? Are you the only one that got? I know that I healed everybody. You're the only one who came back. And you're the only one who lived out your faith in obedience for the reward that I gave you, which is healing. Now I'm going to give you something more because I see your faith. I'm going to give you everlasting. Not only I give you physical healing, but now I'm going to give you spiritual healing. What an amazing thought. 
And so Jesus said, Arise, go your way, your faith has made you made you well. Because of his reward of healing and forgiveness, this leper, this leper couldn't do anything less but to praise God. Now think think about this for just a minute. Think about this. The Bible says that the Lord inhabits the praise of his people. Think about this. If, if the only time that God was around in your life was when you were praising him and openly worshiping him, how often would the presence of God be in your life? Swim, none. Sunday mornings. Maybe if I hear a good song. I mean, have you ever thought about that? How often would the presence of God be revealed in our life if the only time that, that he was there and he was evident and showing up was when we stopped to give him praise and thanksgiving? Heather and I went out fishing today. We were on a pier and we were catching fish and we were doing some, some stuff. But, you know, while I'm out there, I'm thanking God just for the opportunity to enjoy his creation. I could fish all my life, I believe. I love it. Uh, and it, it's it's not catching. Don't get me wrong. There's a difference in fishing and catching. We were out there for about four hours in the heat, caught four fish. I caught four fish. Uh, Heather's laughing right now. Heather had two that got up out of the water, and then they said, no, I like it better in the water. They jumped off the hook, and they kept swimming. Uh, she tried hard, and we had a great time. But but the amazing, while I'm out there, I'm thanking God. When I go out, I, I, Heather can tell you, I hate to stay, I hate to lay out in the sun. I'm not one of these people that does that. I'm either looking for shells when I'm swimming in the waves. And most of the time I'm in the waves. And when I'm in the waves, there's nobody out there but me most of the time. I don't know why people don't like the ocean water. Yes, we saw sharks. We saw a big, somebody latched into one that's about five and a half, six feet long, probably 100 pounds a day out there on the pier. And it was some exciting thing. Right before we left, the guy hooked into something. I don't know what it was. We tried to help him. That thing ripped his line out one of the pier and ripped it back in the other way before it got on some barnacles and broke. Uh, a 50 pound braided line so uh, you can imagine how big that fish was I was trying to hold the line it was cutting through my fingers it was amazing we, we had fun we didn't get to see the fish but you know I go out there and I enjoy God's creation I'm talking to the Lord man Lord thank you thank you man these waves are amazing I don't understand how it is that, that it works I understand it's tides I understand the lunar and all those things that are happening God but you put all this into place and for somebody to think that this just happened takes a lot more faith than for me to believe that creation in the Bible happened and to believe that you're in control and we're just not out here spinning around. Thank you for that, Lord. And I take time to thank God for his creation. And I try to worship him, praise him in the storm, praise him in the good times, the bad times, and to lift up. And we should do that. These lepers didn't know Jesus. They recognized him as being something special. They asked him to have mercy on them. He brought about healing, but he gave salvation to one. Now, I'm going to throw this out there. And you can hate me, love me, whatever you want to. I heard Billy Graham say it a long time ago, probably about 10% of the people who profess to be Christians really are. And, I, and he was asked where he got his evidence, and he said, right here. Because there were 10 people who were healed right here, but only one got salvation. There were 10 people who met Jesus and had something magical, mysterious, I mean, a work of God done in their life, but only one had faith. Do you see that? They, they all had a little bit of faith that they exercised and that they listened to Jesus and did what he told them to do. They followed his command. I guess you could call that faith. But there was only one that revealed his faith and came back and worshiped God. And, and the Bible says that your faith has made you well. You've been, I'm giving you salvation. I'm giving you something special. So my question, church, believer, those who call ourselves that, are we really? Did we praise God? I mean, this guy came back and he fell on his feet and he worshiped and he praised and that's what he wanted to do. I don't know whether Jesus had to peel him off and say, man, get out of here. Go show yourself to the priest. I've already healed you. No, it doesn't look like that because the Bible says that he looked at him and he had this little conversation and then he said, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. Look, man, I'm giving you something else. And when God has given us something else, we ought to want to do nothing but serve him, hold on tight to him, and just be amazed by it. You've heard the story many, many times. At least some of you have. Not everybody on Facebook has. But I want to share it again. It's about a gentleman who from, was from Great Britain. And slavery, if I'm not mistaken, was abolished in Great Britain in the 1600s. And he had come over in the 1800 gold rush. And in the 1840s, he had gone out to California. He had struck it rich, and he was coming back, and he... Come into this little 
town of New, of New Orleans at that point in time in Louisiana. And it was the port in which he was going to get on a boat and sail around and, and go back home. And while he was there, when he came into town, he noticed that there was an auction going on. There was a commotion. And he, he looked up and he saw an auction and he saw slaves being auctioned off. Big old black man was being auctioned off. And boom, the gavel came down and it broke his heart. Slavery broke his heart because it had been abolished for some time now. And he was there, and the next person that was being brought up on the auction block was a beautiful 16, 18-year-old black girl. And every slave owner there was talking about all the things that they wanted to do with this black girl. I mean, they wanted to, to pimp her out. They wanted to do all these things. And this guy sitting there, and his heart's breaking, and the bid comes out, and he bids $5,000, which is about one and a half, two million $2 million of our money back then. A tremendous amount of money. Everybody's looking around like, man, have you got the money? And he drops a bag of gold. And this girl looks at him and says, I don't know you. I don't even know who you are. I don't even know why you wanted to bid against me or bid for me. I don't know you. Please, I know you. Will you bid? I, I know you. Will you bid? I know your farm. I know you. And she was asking all the other plantation owners to please bid against this guy because I don't know him. I don't know what his desires are for me. And none of them had the money. And the auctioneer said, go on once, go on twice. Soul banged the gavel. The guy took the money, dropped it off, and he went and he grabbed hold of the girl's hand. And he helped her off the stage. And she slapped him in the face. And she spit in his face and said, I don't know you. I don't know what your purpose is for me. I hate you. Why did you show up? Why did you come into town? He said, please just come with me. He said, I don't want to go anywhere with you. I don't know you. I don't know what your desires are for me. I know what everybody else wants to do, but I don't know you. You're a foreigner. You're a stranger. Why did you come here? And she just kept kept being antagonistic. She kept slapping him and kept pushing herself away. And, and he kept holding her hand and he took her and he said, just wait out here. And he went in a building and, and, and there was an argument that ensued inside. And, and the only thing that she heard was a stranger say, but it's the law. And then she heard another person say, well, you're a fool. And all of a sudden he comes out and he says, I've got something for you to the young lady that he had just purchased and just bought. And she spit in his face and she slapped him and she said, I don't want anything from you. I don't know who you are. And he took a piece of paper and he put it in front of her. And she took the paper and she threw it down. She said, I don't want your paper. She said, I can't read. I don't even know what it's for. And he picked it up. He said, you're going to want this. And he put it in her hand and he said, this is your emancipation papers. I bought you so that you could be free. And immediately she started weeping. And she fell down and she grabbed hold of his feet. And with tears in her eyes pouring down her face, she looked up at him and she said, but all I want to do is serve you. You see, Jesus bought us off the auction block of sin. He bought us at a high price with his life. He took, took us away from Satan to give us a life forevermore. And we ought to live out our faith and obedience to bring glory and honor to God in our response, in our request, and in our reward. We ought to want to do nothing more than to serve Him. And I hope and pray, I hope and pray if you're watching tonight, that you'll stop and you'll ask yourself this question, am I a part of the 10% or am I a part of the 90? Some of you are like, what, what's, what, what are you talking about? Well, let, me, let me flip over if I can just briefly over to Matthew chapter 7. And, and I hope that you're a part of the 10%. Remember there were 10 lepers, 10 only one came back. Only one got saved. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23, it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. For many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to you, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You see, there's going to be a lot of people one of these days who are going to cry out and say, Lord, Lord, just like Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. The things that you did were lawless, were unauthorized. They were not done because of a relationship with Jesus Christ. Are you a part of the 10%? Or are you a part of the 90? Do you know Jesus is Lord? He says that's the most important thing. And if you do, then live out your faith and obedience in your response, in your request and in your reward. I hope and pray that if you're watching tonight that you know Jesus. If you don't, right where you are, you can just cry out to Him, Lord, man, I'm a sinner. My life's a mess. I've made a mess of it. 
But Jesus, I believe you died on an old rugged cross. And I believe that because of your death, that's the only way my sins can be forgiven. And I'm asking you to forgive me of my sin. I'm asking you to come into my life and, and help me to repent and turn to you. I believe that you rose again on the third day and that you can give me everlasting life. And I'm trusting you, Jesus, to be master, owner, master, and ruler. I'm asking you, Jesus, to be the Lord in my life. Save me right now. The Bible says that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Tonight, you can be a part of the 10%. You don't have to be a part of the 90 anymore. You can be a part of the 10%. Trust Him. Trust Him tonight. Thank you, Facebook Live. I'm glad that you joined in. Uh, just a couple things to remember Sunday morning. We will start at 9.30. I'll be sending a message out. There'll be a message posted already. Already is posted to our website. Probably be going out on Facebook sometime later on tonight. Uh, we'll be uh, starting our worship at 9.30 to try to beat the heat. Our 4th of July celebration, Faith, Family, and Freedom, on July 4th, that Saturday, will start at 6 o'clock. We're going to have a meeting after church Sunday morning, so probably somewhere around 10, 30, 11 o'clock, we're going to have a meeting for Faith, Family, and Freedom to talk about food, to talk about uh, uh, what we're going to do setup-wise, that kind of thing, uh, talk about anything and everything that needs to come up, uh, trying to get Porta Johns out there so people can use restrooms, make sure we've got ice cream, make sure we've got... Uh, watermelons, desserts, and those kinds of things. So uh, I'm asking church family for you to stick around so that we can all get on board and help with faith, family, and freedom. Realize there's not a whole lot of fireworks shows going on, but there will be one happening at Mall's Chapel Baptist Church on the 4th of July that evening. So come and be a part of that. It won't cost you anything. Just your time. Everything's free. We love you. We want you to come and participate. We'll also be sharing the gospel. Got a band that's coming to play. I'm looking forward to that as well. So Come and be a part. And then on July the 5th, we were planning on going inside, but with all the things that are going on, we'll stay outside. Uh, so just uh, keep looking for some posts on Facebook and on the website, and uh, as well as text messages from me, kind of letting you know what's going on. But we do have a mission trip meeting this coming Sunday night, 5 o'clock, for those of you who are on the uh, part of the mission team. Uh, we're going to try to get some things going and organized, making sure that we've got everything going. We're just a week away from that, guys. So uh, this coming Sunday night and Wednesday night, uh, next Wednesday will be our last meeting, and then we'll be leaving Sunday morning at 8 o'clock. And so we'll come and help get set up for that July the 5th worship that's outdoors, and then uh, we're going to be heading down to the beach and getting trained and prepared. Uh, we actually do a backyard Bible club or a day camp that evening. Uh, with one of our low-income housing places in Myrtle Beach on Sunday evening, so be much in prayer for that team as well. Uh, be much in prayer for those who are on a prayer list. There's a lot of people who are hurting, a lot of people who are struggling with things. And good to see you, Facebook Live. We love you. Live from Myrtle Beach. Heather, you want to say something? Here she is. She's like, no! Look at her. Now she's hiding herself. That's all right. Everybody gets to see that. And there she is. She's beautiful. <laughs> Uh, but uh, y'all be much in prayer for Hope. Uh, we're going to miss her over the next six, seven weeks that she's serving down here as well and pray for us that we can get through it all. We love you, and uh, we'll see you Sunday morning, 9.30 a.m.